So uh, what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, it's a fairly short presentation with some fairly sort of short, sharp, punchy points just about how we've come to understand some of the limitations of nerve stimulation and some of the potential uh, uh, continued uses of nerve stimulation when we're doing peripheral nerve blocks. And really it's come out of a number of studies in the last sort of 10 years or so uh, looking at these. So just, I'm going to give you the whole presentation in one slide just to start, just so you know where we're going with this. Uh, basically, nerve stimulation, what does it have? Well, it has a high sensitivity, uh, but it still doesn't tell us where the local anesthetic is going. So in other words, we know that when you've got a, a motor endpoint with your nerve stimulator, you've got a very high likelihood of being very, very close to the nerve. However, I'm sure you've all had this experience, you get a great stimulation, you inject your local anesthetic, and the block still doesn't happen. Why is that? And uh, we've maybe had some clues as to that in the last 10 years with ultrasound. It's been, been a fascinating time, actually. It has a low specificity. In other words, the, uh, the rate of false negative um, is quite high. It's about 25%. In other words, when, uh, if you've got a negative motor endpoint with your stimulator, you can still be right on or even inside the nerve. And uh, it, a lack of stimulation does not tell you that you're not close to the nerve. It does remain very useful for deeper blocks, such as lumbar plexus block, a SATA block, and other similar blocks. It's a useful means of telling you that you're close to the nerve with those techniques. It does, in my hands anyway, and the way I teach continuous peripheral nerve blocks, remain useful as a way of placing continuous peripheral nerve blocks in combination with ultrasound. And it may be a useful warning sign of intraneural needle placement, especially if you've got a very low current. Uh, it, that may indicate that you might actually be intraneural, and it might be a reason to pull back your needle slightly. So that's basically the uh, presentation in a nutshell. So I'd like to say thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so point one. Peripheral nerve stimulation has uh, high sensitivity, and we, we know that. We've known that for a number of years. As you get closer to the nerve, um, basically the intensity of your stimulation gets greater. And, uh, and that's kind of reassuring. And we know that when you've got a nice uh, uh, motor endpoint with your nerve stimulator, you know that you're probably pretty close to the nerve. Um, I've suspected for a number of years... Um, try and advance this, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that the, the classic endpoint of 0.5 milliamps, which we all try and seek, or we used to seek with, with nerve stimulation techniques alone, was actually too low. And, and in fact, there's been studies that have shown that. This was one from Carlo Franco, where he basically used a supraclavicular technique, and he, and he demonstrated essentially that 0.9 milliamps, or 1 milliamp or less, was essentially the same as 0.5 milliamps in terms of getting successful block uh, with, with the supraclavicular technique. And I've certainly seen this with a number of other of our techniques, and with continuous catheters, in fact, and I very rarely dial the current much lower than one milliamp with a continuous catheter because I don't think it really improves my block success and it potentially uh, considerably extends the, uh, the sort of uh, fussing around time um, with your catheter if you do try and get uh, currents below that. And certainly the, uh, the, uh, the conclusion from Carlo's study was that when nerve blocks are performed with a nerve stimulator, it's customary to reduce current to less than or equal to 0.5 milliamps prior to injection, but apparently this is not necessary with a supraclavicular block. And he basically showed in this uh, nice study that 0.9 milliamps was equivalent to 0.5 milliamps. And really it was the type of endpoint that you need to focus on rather than the, the, uh, the, the current amplitude. But the, uh, the important point with the sensitivity of nerve stimulation is although you can get a nice twitch uh, with the stimulator, that may not actually give you a good block. And I've certainly had lots of experience of that in the past with my uh, block techniques. Um, despite having done several thousand blocks or maybe more over the years, um, uh, I've still had patients where I've had a great endpoint and you inject and you don't get a successful block. Some of these diagrams might illustrate why that might be. This is an illustration of the auxiliary uh, breakup uh, uh, anatomy with ultrasound. You can see the auxiliary artery. We've got the biceps, the triceps muscle down here. We've got the location of the median, the ulna, and the radial nerves. And I've had times in the past prior to ultrasound where we've been getting a great radial twitch. The needle's been down here on the radial nerve. You inject and you still get a failure of the radial nerve. Why is that? Well, with ultrasound, we've been able to see that... Uh, uh, um, i get that arrow back in. I'm going to use the pointer here. With ultrasound, we've actually been able to see that, in fact... Can you hear me now? You hear me okay? Yeah, great. Um, 
you may be above a tissue barrier here. So when you think you're getting it, you've got a great motor endpoint, you inject a local anesthetic, you get all your spread above here and nothing actually around the nerve. And that, you know, these were sort of really uh, interesting times about sort of six, seven years ago when we were doing these first studies with ultrasound and seeing all those things. But the key to, to what I'm saying is it's a local anesthetic spread that's the, the important factor here. It's not necessarily the motor endpoint. So motor endpoints can give you a good guide as to proximity to nerve, but it, they're not going to tell you where your local anesthetic spread is going. And we've seen this with uh, a number of our different blocks, including the auxiliary block, the infraclavicular block. Uh, this is an example of a supraclavicular block. Uh, and we know, you know, you, as, for those of you that aren't familiar with this image, anterior scalene muscle, this is lateral, so subclavian artery. Um, we've got the, the, the trunks of the brachial plexus here, basically the upper trunk, middle trunk, and then the uh, inferior trunk just lying in the corner pocket here between the subclavian artery. And this is actually the, uh, the pleura between the first rib and the second rib here. But if you just place your local anesthetic in one location, you might get a block failure because of failure to spread to the other parts of the plexus. And in the past, we'd have accepted a nice motor endpoint, a distal motor endpoint, put in 20 or 30 mils of local anesthetic, and then wondered why the heck is the block not working. And that's the reason why, is because the spread's not been adequate. And certainly with the supraclavicular block, we are, we are seeing instances of failure now, of especially the, uh, the inferior trunk, and it may be because practitioners are tending to go into the main body of the plexus here at the, the upper and the middle trunk, and failing to get the inferior trunk down in the corner pocket. And I think that's mainly because of the fear of pranging the pleura when you get too, too far close to that area. So basically, the sensitivity of nerve stimulation is useful, but it doesn't tell you anything about local anesthetic spread. So that's one of the limitations, and that's where ultrasound may be useful. I think I might have jumped ahead. Did I jump ahead there? No, I didn't. Okay. Okay, so... Uh, uh, one of the more useful things about the sensitivity of nerve stimulation, though, is it may tell you when you're intraneural. And this is a study that we, that, uh, we performed when I was at Toronto Western Hospital. Vincent uh, led this study, basically placing needles inside pig auxiliary or nerves in the axilla and looking at what sort of current you needed to actually stimulate those nerves. And we got some kind of surprising results because we all assumed that we'd be able to stimulate the nerves uh, with very, very low currents in every case. Let's see. Oops, sorry. And basically what we demonstrated with this study was that, yeah, about 50% of the, the nerves you could stimulate at very low currents, between 0.2 to 0.5 milliamps, but there were a very high proportion, about 45% of, uh, of these nerves, where you couldn't stimulate below 0.5 milliamps. So basically what's that, what that tells you is with nerve stimulation, if you've got a low current, you may be intraneural. So if you're anything below sort of 0.4 milliamps, you have to be a bit careful, maybe pull your needle back slightly. But if you haven't got stimulation, it doesn't mean that you're not intraneural. So you have to use a number of other potential safeguards against intraneural injection if you believe that intraneural injection is a bad thing, of course. Um, in order to prevent intraneural injection. And things like injection pressure, pain on injection, uh, uh, and paresthesia in the distribution of the nerve, and then the, uh, the, the ultrasound image as well. One of the other things we demonstrated from this study was that you can see intraneural placement of local anesthetic quite nicely, and you see the expansion of the nerve uh, when, you, when you're placing your local anesthetic in there. So that's a potentially useful uh, uh, feature of, uh, of nerve stimulation. So the take-home messages from this first part of the presentation is that the nerve stimulation at currents less than one milliamp indicates needle to nerve proximity, and that's quite a useful sign, especially when you're learning ultrasound guided techniques. It's often useful to, uh, to combine nerve stimulation and ultrasound, and I'll talk a bit more about that on Sunday. Ultrasound should be used to guide local anesthetic spread, however, because your stimulator doesn't tell you really anything about that. The motor response at very low currents may indicate intraneural placement, so you may want to be careful with that. An absence of nerve stimulation does not guarantee absence of intraneural placement. So what about point number two? Well, nerve stimulation has low specificity. In other words, it's got a, a high false negative rate. And this study that uh, I was involved with at Toronto West and Anahi Perlis led this study, a uh, very nice study, where we basically uh, did an auxiliary block and when we did the auxiliary block, we approached the median nerve with the needle, and we pushed on the, the nerve with the needle, and then we turned the stimulator on, and we, we, we tried to have a look at what sort of current you needed to actually stimulate the nerve. And one of the things we found from that study was that when you're pushing on a nerve, very few people get, actually get a paresthesia. It's kind of interesting. We thought before that time that if you pushed on a nerve with, with a needle, you'd get a paresthesia straight away. Patients might even uh, complain of a lot of pain. That didn't seem to be the case. 
And then when you turned on the stimulator, um, you actually acquired higher currents than you'd normally expect uh, to actually stimulate the nerve in a high proportion of cases. So you can see that uh, at 0.5 milliamps, there was a motor endpoint in 76% of cases, but in 26% of cases, or sorry, in 20, 26 cases out of 102, uh, there was no motor endpoint at 0.5 milliamps. Once again, demonstrating that an absence of motor endpoint does not tell you that you're not on the nerve. Okay, and that's one of the limitations of nerve stimulation. So I've got a little uh, video there to show you. Let's have a look at that. See if I can get this working without messing up the whole presentation. That's not going to work. Okay, we'll forget that. Okay, just advance to the next slide for me. Okay, good. Thank you. So the take-home message from that, you know, the low specificity with nerve stimulation is that take the ultrasound visual endpoint every time. If you've got, if you're, if you're learning to use ultrasound, or even if you're an experienced practitioner and you're not sure uh, why you haven't got a nerve stimulation endpoint, but you're almost sure that the needle's on the nerve, you know, based on your image that you've got in front of you, take your ultrasound endpoint every time because the uh, the, the the nerve stimulation endpoint sometimes can be negative, or about a quarter of the time can be negative uh, when you think it should be positive. Um, and I've seen that many, many times with different types of blocks, especially the sciatic nerve block for some reason. When you've got the needle on the sciatic nerve, you can actually even go through the sciatic nerve by accident and fail to get stimulation. It's, it's kind of surprising. Okay, so point number three um, out of the four points. Nerve stimulation remains very useful for deeper blocks. And a few years ago, I was doing a number of lumbar plexus blocks with ultrasound. I was trying to look at a better way of doing a lumbar plexus block without having to rely on nerve stimulation. And I was using this paper, this nice paper from Manoj Kamaka, who's here at this meeting, uh, where he basically demonstrated a lot of the anatomy with lumbar plexus block with ultrasound. Uh, and demonstrated how you could place your needle, especially in a, a longitudinal, a, a, para, a parasagal longitudinal technique, um, and, and you know placing the needle into into the psoas muscle. And uh, hopefully we'll have an image here to show you. And so there we go. He called it the the trident sign because basically, especially in in some of the slimmer patients as that he has in in, uh, in Hong Kong, you can get this nice trident sign. Where you've got the three tridents, which are the shadows of the transverse processes. And then in between the transverse processes, you've got the psoas muscle, and you've got an image of the lumbar plexus uh, within the the psoas muscle. Unfortunately, in Canada, our patients are a little on the larger side than I think Manoj's patients in in Hong Kong, and they're a little bit more pa better padded, and you don't often get any sort of image of the lumbar plexus. So you're guessing as to really where the nerves lie in relation to that image of the psoas muscle. And so using nerve stimulation in conjunction with ultrasound in that situation is very useful. And I was kind of reassured when I spoke to Manoj a few years ago when I was in, in Australia teaching with him. And I was saying, you know, how, how do you, you know, I was trying to look at the planes and look at the muscles and, and see where I could place my, my needle to, to kind of get it close to the, the uh, lumbar plexus without having to use nerve stimulation. And he said to me, actually, Colin, I, should, I still use nerve stimulation all the time. So that was kind of reassuring for me as well, to know that uh, one of the people that's developed these techniques is still using nerve stimulation in conjunction, especially for these deeper blocks. And I've often found nerve stimulation to be useful, especially with very big patients doing sciatic blocks um, and, and, and some of the other deeper blocks as well. So the take-home message basically is that the use of nerve stimulation with ultrasound for deeper blocks assists with nerve lo lo uh, uh, location prior to injection. Once again, it doesn't tell you anything about spread, however. Um, so you, you often end up using a little larger volume in those cases. I think I've got the, uh, the orchestra playing, have I? Is that, uh, it's not the orchestra starting. Okay, good. All right, so point number four. Nerve stimulation remains a useful method for assisting placement of perineural catheters. Um, 
as, uh, as, as, as Gert was saying, Gert Jam was saying, studies do indicate the catheters are often placed more quickly with ultrasound. And certainly Ed Mariano has done some nice studies, we'll talk about one in a few moments, where he's demonstrated quite convincingly that the ultrasound, you can place a catheter much more quickly. However, there isn't really any data at the present time demonstrating that an ultrasound placed catheter works any better or, uh, than a nerve stimulator guided catheter. In fact, we had some preliminary work at Toronto West and actually uh, done by Cedric Lewitt. Um, he's also published a lot of the data on, on, the, on the coil catheter demonstrating that a nerve stimulator guided endpoint may actually provide a slightly better um, pain relief um, especially for secondary catheter uh, success than a, an ultrasound guided catheter and we're just in the process of uh, preparing that for publication. Uh, but basically you can place a catheter very nicely, very quickly with a nerve stimulator. In practice though, what I tended to do is use a combination of nerve stimulation with ultrasound, especially when I'm teaching residents and fellows. You can often get a nerve stimulation endpoint uh, after uh, using ultrasound to place the needle on the nerve very quickly, and that allows you to slide the, the, the stimulating catheter up the nerve very fast and uh, place the catheter in a very short period of time. I haven't found it quite so quick with ultrasound, um, but it's maybe uh, more my practice than anything else. So this is one of these studies by Mariano and colleagues, basically where they looked at infraclavicular brachial plexus, perineural catheterization, ultrasound versus nerve stimulation. Their primary endpoint was time to place the catheter. It wasn't the success of the overall catheter uh, technique itself, and that's possibly one of the limitations of these studies. So what you basically see with it, study uh, very nicely, and we see this in practice all the time, is that with nerve stimulation, that's the darker uh, boxes here, uh, you see that most catheters, or uh, sorry, I shouldn't say most, about a third of the catheters go in very quickly, a third of them take a, a fair amount longer, then a third of them you just really can't place with nerve stimulation at all. And certainly I've seen this in my own practice. Uh, however, with ultrasound, the, the consistency of placing the block is much more, it's, you know, it's much more consistent. The, the mean time is probably about the same if slightly less than nerve stimulation, but the standard deviation is much, much uh, uh, lower with uh, the ultrasound-guided technique compared to the nerve stimulator-guided technique. So what does that mean in practice? It means in practice that when I'm placing a catheter with ultrasound and nerve stimulation, I'll usually have the stimulator on, and I'll, I'll try and slide the catheter up with stimulation. If that doesn't work very quickly within one or two passes, I'll just convert to a, a complete ultrasound-guided technique and place the catheter with ultrasound. And, uh, and, and that's been a very sort of fast, slick way of placing catheters in my hands. So, that's basically it. So in summary, nerve stimulation has a high sensitivity, but it doesn't tell us about local anesthetic spread. Um, it has low specificity, so you, if you don't have a stimulation, that doesn't mean that you're not close to the nerve. It remains very useful for nerve location with deeper blocks. Um, it does remain, in my hands in, uh, anyway, very useful for continuous peripheral nerve blocks, and it is a useful warning of intraneural needle placement. So thank you very much. <laughs>